Okay, ooh, that's really loud. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me today. It's a real honor to be on a TEDx stage here at Taylor's College. And I love what we're talking about today. I love the idea of turning your passion into your profession and, and talking about how do you go about doing that. And when I was thinking about today, of what I wanted to share with you, I thought a lot about, well, how do you know when you actually have turned your passion into your profession? So what does it mean to have made it? And how do you know when you'll make it? And maybe we've, we're actually making it continuously and time and time again. And so when I sat and really thought about this, I had realized in my own path that there have been some crucial realizations that I've had in coming to the point of actually being able to stand here and say, I am at making my passion my profession. And what are some of those realizations? They come up for me every day, and I thought that therefore they would be worthwhile to share with you. So I want to talk a little bit about how I got to Malaysia. And so, you know, I want to share with you th this idea of, of getting there and, and how we typically use traditional milestones um, to define how we've gotten there. So we use, we use things like graduation, or getting into college, graduating college, getting your first job, getting your first raise, um, as these traditional milestones to tell us that we've gotten there. And once we've gotten there, then what does it mean you know, after that? So maybe it's a new career, a new job, an extravagant vacation. Um, that may now tell us that we've gotten there. But really, how are you going to know? How do you know that you've made it? And so, going a little bit back to how I got here, I started where I graduated from university and thought, okay, now the goal is to work to get my way up into the corner office of a Fortune 500 company in downtown Chicago and working for a place like General Mills, and I thought that that's what success meant. I thought that the pinnacle of my success would be to get in that corner office, because that's what my university professors had told me, and so that's what I believed. And I clearly had some massive incongruence with that, because instead of taking a step this direction towards you know, that beginning sales job to climbing up the corporate ladder, I took a massive leap over to UPM, University of Putra, Malaysia, and this is where I landed. So I had at that point thought, okay, I want to continue to travel. I want to, I want to give an impact. I want to volunteer before I get into this nine to five job, that dirty word of a job. But that's what I thought that I had to do to get to where I wanted to be. And so instead, I, I was like, well, okay, I'll, I'll, I want to volunteer. And Malaysia looked exotic and beautiful and amazing. And that, you know, this didn't exactly quite ma match what my perspective of you know, Malaysia on Google Images showed. <laughs> but but the, nonetheless, this is where I ended up. And so I started teaching um, HIV talks for college students and high school students. And actually, it's funny, I did a talk in this very same room almost four years ago. And that's how I started here in Malaysia. I talked to, you know, people about HIV education and wellness. And, and so from then, I continued to um, stay here in Malaysia. After those six weeks, I had the worst opinion about Malaysia. I thought it was just, I was miserable. I had the loneliest, worst six weeks of, that I knew of my life up until that point. And I had decided, okay, I can take off and take the rest of this money that I had decided to put towards um, being here in Malaysia and just go travel and do something else. But I had taken a massive risk, right? So I had decided instead of stepping towards being, a, you know, getting a job in for working for a corporation, I took this massive leap of faith and took a major risk. And to me, at that point, it would have been a failure to have not changed that perspective of Malaysia. And so I stayed for another 10 months and basically continued to ask around. I asked for, where can I live? I had everything on my back. I had six weeks of clothing. And I went into the city and found somewhere to work and found somewhere to live in the exact same day and stayed for an additional 10 months. By that point, had spent every penny in my bank account, 
had maxed out my credit card as much as I could. I couldn't spend any more money. I had to humbly ask my parents for a one-way ticket home. And so that's what I did. And went back home. But instead of, at that point, I had, I had not gained anything financially. But I had gained the biggest gift of experience. I, working for that for an organization called PT Foundation, I found myself walking around the streets of Chow Kit on a daily basis. Me, in the streets of Chow Kit, every day, like leaving at 11 o'clock at night. And just thought like, oh, well, this is just what I'm doing. Why not? And it was an incredible experience. I spoke face to face with people here in this country that were facing HIV discrimination. And like it, it was an incredible experience. And so I went back celebrating. Because although I had, you know, probably I guess it was about $10,000 in the hole at that point, I was like, I have a priceless experience. And so I thought about this part of my story of getting to where I have been. And in that, I'm often reminded of these three realizations that I've had. And that's what I want to share with you today, of looking at how you know you've made it. Because at that point, I wouldn't have thought like, OK, I've, I've made it. I've done something good, right? Um, and so the first realization that I want to share with you is about this idea of the feel of fear of failure. We hear a lot of people talk about failure. And the speakers today have also already talked about you know, this idea of the one step taking risks doing things. And so this fear of failure comes from, it, it's a, an excuse for inaction a lot of the time. And we have some, sometimes such deeply ingrained fears about what we I, you know, want to do and pursuing um, this idea of turning your passion into your profession. And oftentimes, it's masked by it's masked by procrastination. And so procrastination is sometimes the easiest way to cover up the sphere of failure that we have. And so you know, instead of deciding, OK, I'm going to go do this, we say, I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I've got so many things on. I just can't possibly do any things. But what's actually going on for you there? Is there actually something much deeper in terms of the sphere that's, that's happening? And so when I decided that, at you know, my point in this path about close to a year ago to decide to start my own online um, consulting business, I had decided like, well, uh, maybe it's really not the right time. I haven't really saved up that much money. I can't really do this. And I had a friend ask me, and all he said to me is like, well, what's the worst that can happen? And I was like, well, I could basically run out of money and have to move back to the States and go live with my parents and ask my college job to take me back for a fourth time. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I've actually done that before. That's not so bad. I can do this. I can do this again. So why not take that risk? Why not take that leap of faith? And so that procrastination for me, I was able to reframe and just kind of say, OK, well, what, what if I dive straight into this fear? And so there's oftentimes these two different ways of looking at emotions. We have towards emotions and away emotions. And the ones that drive us towards something, we naturally want to gravitate towards them. This is a natural human tendency to want to move towards happiness and joy, acceptance. But there's also away emotions, things that we want to, that we naturally move away from. And this, these are fear, pain, suffering. These are things that we don't want to experience, that we don't want to move towards. And so I, what I would like to offer up as a challenge is for you to be able to reframe the meaning of fear. So in fear, there's oftentimes so much for us to discover about ourselves. There's oftentimes you know, things that are underlying that if we took a step towards it, We'd have so much knowledge about ourselves. And either way, you will always have a positive return on stepping towards a fear. Because you will have learned something about yourself. You will have great experience that no one, you can't pay anyone any amount of money to teach you that type of lesson. And so by moving towards the sphere and reframing it as an opportunity, you may find that there's incredible things for you to discover. And you're at a point in your life right now 
it's where, what's the next step? What is the next step that you're going to take? And there's a lot of fear around that. And so being able to just move into that, that fear will have an incredible value and opportunity for you. And so for me, I had to continue to ask myself throughout this whole process, because believe me, when you are when you don't have a monthly income, when you are relying on people to say yes to you, that they believe in your knowledge, that you might be able to make a difference in their business, there's a lot of days where you feel like, oh my god, what am I doing? You know, can I really do this? Do I just need to go get a job? But I come back to you, what's the worst that can happen? And there's so much to gain. There's so much to gain in that. And so I encourage you at this point for yourself to reframe these fears that you may have about what's next, what's next in this path for me. And so the next point that I'd like to share with you is something I call comparisonitis. And this is something that really rings true to myself because this is one that I have to remind myself on a daily basis. Um, and so first I'd like to share with you a bit of a story. So I have an older brother. He's, it's just him and I. He's two years older than me. And I, my whole, for most of my life, I have always compared myself to him. I've always thought, okay, well, he played soccer, so I played soccer. He played trumpet, I played saxophone. He moved to France, I moved to France. He moved to Oman, I moved to Oman. He traveled to Southeast Asia, I traveled to Southeast Asia. We did, I did exactly what he did. And I thought, oh, but I'm never going to be as good as him. He's now in law school. I definitely can't go to law school. <laughs> and so I thought, well, you know, I was constantly comparing and, and putting myself down for not doing it maybe as good as he did, or not doing it the way you know, that I should have. But, and I brought this competitive, comparative nature into my business and into what I'm doing now, comparing myself to people who, who were 10 years older than me and 10 years further into, this, into their business. And I realized how much it was stifling my passion, my creativity, my productivity. And because I continued to think like, oh, well, I should, I should be earning that much. They're doing, and then I had to stop and realize, well, I've only been doing this for 10 months, so it's OK. And I needed to stop thinking that I was 35 and just embrace being 25 and just stop and say, I am here, this is what I'm doing, and this is, this is me, and this is my unique path. And so, because no matter what, when you're comparing yourself, you kind of move into two different spaces, right? There's one space where you put, your, you put yourself into trying, it, well, it becomes an inferior mode, right? Because you're looking to all those people who have gone before you and done more and, and with more success than you. And so comparing them to, you know, I should be there. Oh, why haven't I done this? And it's a constant negative mental chatter that will continually bring way down, way down on you. And then there's the other side of where you look down to people where you're looking at, oh, well, I'm so much better than them. I've like done so much more than they have. Well, at least I've done this much, right? Which is also an extremely negative emotion to embody and hold on to. Why? Because it's, um, it's, bringing in a false sense of security, a false sense of confidence, because you're looking to other people to judge them, critique them, to find some sort of strength in yourself. So there's a bit of an inner child, a bit of an inner need to actually fuel confidence. So either way, it is a dark, deep hole into co with co comparing con constantly. And so I encourage you to then start to use these people that are in your life who have gone on to do, who have large success because that's a crucial place in your life. And thankfully, I have an incredible amount of like very, very successful people in my life that I get to aspire to. And so there's a balance that needs to be reflected upon because this comparisonitis can be something that goes undetected, right? Until you look at, at that self-reflection in the mirror and you know that self-reflection doctor to tell you that you know to relieve this comparisonitis and so these these people that have gone on before you to to do incredible things use them as an example use them as a way to define new goals for you of what is possible of what you could achieve 
but rather <laughs> use that as a way to aspire to rather than think I should be there, I need to be there, why am I not there? Um, and, and so I encourage you that as you're moving through, like have I made it? And looking at these people who have made it and to stop and actually celebrate your uniqueness and your path. Because although you may, we want to copy things, you're actually never creating a copy. You're creating something on your own because there's your own unique view of the world, your unique view of how you would do something that is very different than anyone else. And so you're bringing that into, into your experience and, there's, and for you to celebrate that. Which brings me to the last point of bringing the celebration into your daily life. Um, celebrating every little step of the way. Because as we are talking about have I made it, it is easy to forego and lose sight of what the goals were before. And so as you're thinking about what I want to achieve now into the future, you may arrive there and have completely forgotten to take a second to stop and celebrate. And so I encourage you to bring this celebration into the small things of your life and to consistently acknowledging and celebrating every moment of the day, every, every step of the way, because every day there is something to celebrate. And even for myself, at, some, at one point in time, my passion, which I've recently turned into my profession, became a job because it felt like work again because I had stopped bringing the celebration. And I, one day I was just like, oh, I'm just really not excited about doing this. And even though it was my passion, and not so long ago, I decided to make that step into making this my profession. And so I, I was on a call with a business mentor of mine, and he said to me, he's like, hey, wait a second. You're 25. You're successfully running your own business. That in itself is something to celebrate because a lot of people would be way too scared to do it, way too afraid to actually just take that step. And I was like, wow, he's right. Actually, just need to stop and celebrate that again. Even though there's all these other things on my list of what I want to do and where I want to be, I'm living in the future. I'm not actually just taking a second and to stop and acknowledge the now. And so, and so it is really important, it is crucial to continue to ignite that passion and fire in your life to move forward in, by celebrating. And so for each person in this room, your celebration is going to be different. I celebrate things like having a really productive work week because it's easy to not to when you're on your own all the time. I celebrate things like getting a client on the phone that I've been wanting to talk to, signing a client and getting paid. Like that's a really big celebration, right? And so I celebrate these things on different magnitudes. And so, you know, productive week I might celebrate by giving myself, you know, going out for a massage or a mani-pedi or just some extra time, like two hours of me time where I can do whatever I want. Maybe it's going to sit in the sauna, maybe it's reading a book, whatever. But y give yourself these ways of celebrating. Give yourself a fun fund, ways to actually take like, okay, I've had, a, I had an amazing exam score. Go celebrate and, and do it in a way that is that will fuel you to the next. So sometimes celebrating, we think, woo, let's go out and get hammered, right? <laughs> but, so that's, that's great to celebrate as well, but do, really try to bring the celebration into something that is going to fuel you to the next stage. So that's this idea of stopping, taking a moment to acknowledge and celebrate. Because the more that you can access that feeling of success, the easier it is to replicate. And so when there are these goals that are far out there that only those goals get celebrated, it's hard to access this feeling of success and to replicate f over and over. And so I encourage you to take this celebration and bring it into your daily life and to celebrate and be grateful for life. And, and moving forward, I mean, these are things that I, these are the three top things that I really try to acknowledge every day, to think about when I move forward, if I want to, you know, try starting a different business, you know, really checking in with my fear of fears around it and comparing to other people. And so I wanted to share these with you today um, to really hopefully inspire you in your own path and where you're at of 
just checking in and, and reminding yourself that you're doing incredible things and you're on a path to success and you're on a path to being able to make your passion your profession and you surely will. And sometimes we just need a little bit of reminder and the best reminders come from within. And so the more you can bring these into your daily living, um, the easier this path becomes. And so the last, the last thing I want to leave you with is that really this journey is the reward. So talking about have I made it and when will I know that I'm there. It's actually a journey. And so every step of the way, that end game is going to change over and over and over again. What you decide today of what your end game is, you might achieve at 28, 29. But by then, your end game has changed. And so this journey is that whole reward. And so I leave you with that today. Thank you very much for having me.